Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first live stream broadcast from Row Gallery. I'm so excited to be here. For those of you I've not had the pleasure of meeting, I'm Ken Rowe, and this is Snickel Fritz. He's our little mascot here. So he's done his job. I'm going to let him go. So we, um, we have a lot of questions to answer today. And number one is, why are we doing this? Well, I guess we have to address the first elephant in the room, and that is because we need to come to you since you are not able to come to us, and that's the coronavirus. With that said, uh, we're obviously not traveling, and so I hope this finds you in good health, your friends are safe, your family and everybody else. We're all doing well here. Um, it's business as usual here at Row Gallery because the only thing that is different is the close sign on the doors. But Monica and I are here from 11 to 5 every day. And guess what? This is my studio. Why would I want to be anywhere else than in this environment sculpting? And even if I don't have an audience, it's a wonderful environment. So let's, let's just say that uh, my goal with this segment and these live streams is I want to bring in as many of our guest artists that show with us as I can to give you not just the finished product of what, you're, of what they're doing. I want them to show you the creative process of how they achieve these amazing works of art and how they approach the problems they may have in front of them, what their inspirations are, and everything else. So I'm going to keep this, this first segment short, probably 15, 20 minutes, because we're have, we have a lot to cover uh, in future segments. And so the cat is out of the bag. This is the piece I'm going to be working on. And thanks to Butch and Helen, you know who you are, I've given, been given the rare opportunity to make this piece life-size. And so that's what we're going to do with these live stream presentations is every week we're going to follow the progress of this piece that you're going to be a part of, and you'll see why in just a minute. So another answer, a question to be answered is, why do this now? Well, it's something we should have done years ago, for sure. But if art, great art, evokes great emotion, joy, or whatever, what better time than to show you the creative process and hope that just for a moment, you're not thinking about what's going on out there. So let us bring you some pleasure into your lives, some entertainment maybe, or whatever that might be to, uh, get you to be a part of the creative process. So let's get going. Okay, so as I said, the cat is out of the bag. And thanks to Helen and Butch, they have commissioned me to do this piece life size. So we're often asked, <coughs> excuse me, how do you start? So I have to give you some background first. I was a taxidermist. And so my wife, Monica, and I, um, many years ago in the tax room business, about seven year mark, I realized I could not make a living at it. And so I thought, well, my mother was an artist. My dad was an engineer. Maybe I can take some of those elements together and make a career out of sculpting animals. That's what I did in taxidermy. So we took a college course, and it was as if I walked in that classroom and God hit me over the head and said, you're going to do this for a living for the rest of your life. And I just, it was one of those profound moments in my life that I knew where I was going to go. I didn't care what it took in terms of work or anything else. I was going to, it was going to just happen. So here we are 31 years later and I'm still at it. So as a taxidermist, I have all this knowledge in anatomy and wildlife physiology because you studied it intensely. So I was so thankful to have that knowledge to pull into what I, what I now do. But here's the thing. We were taught that if you want to sculpt a piece or paint a piece, you get a photo out of a magazine or you take your own, you take it to your studio and you create this masterpiece. Well, what I found out is it doesn't work for me. I have to have live reference. So if you are trying to capture life in your pieces, you have to have life in front of you. So since I'm a very literal sculptor in my work, I'm just basically a glorified Xerox machine. I'm trying to copy what I see. 
So I started seeking out reference for live animals. And so you can imagine this. Yeah, that's me, believe it or not. 30, no, that's like 25 years ago. So now, instead of using a photo, I'm actually, actually able to handle Simba, this mountain lion, and sculpt the piece at the same time. So the translation is perfect because I don't have to worry about what I can't see because it's right here. So imagine, look at that shoulder. If I'm trying to create that shoulder, I can touch it and handle it, pull that into my piece, and hopefully pull that life into what I'm working on. So leading up to this piece, this, this maquette, which I sculpted in the field, I was able to handle Simba, touch his feet as he walked, touched his shoulders. I could feel his muscles moving. I could feel his bones. I could feel every aspect of that cat. Combine that with my study of anatomy, and by the time I'm ready to sculpt him, I'm literally shaking. I cannot wait to start sculpting him. So on top of that, I decided, okay, well, as a taxidermist, you study the skeleton, and then everything is based on the origin and insertion of muscles based on the skeleton. Well, this is an armature. It took me years to develop this. And so anyway, in the field, I can take this armature, and I've cut the length of each one of these tubes, the length of the bones of this animal. So now, as I sculpt him, I can actually use this articulated skeleton to sculpt the piece. So now this is taxidermy. This is how I learned. So I'm virtually building this animal from the inside out. So um, what I would do is, so, okay, now I've got this size. I worked in the field. Now I'm going to mathematically scale it to this size. This is what we would call a maquette or a masterwork for the big version. So I want you guys to be a part of this whole process. And so this is how the armature begins for a life size. There you go. So this is the method of my madness. I have taken 200 measurements of this, and I have scaled it mathematically to this size. This is going to be my blueprint for the entire process. And this is what I want you guys to watch as we progress over weeks and months as I sculpt this piece from the inside out. So this is the cat that's been let out of the bag. So with that said, you can see everything's flexible. I can move it around. The legs are detachable. And I can even move the legs where the joints naturally occur. So that is my blueprint. So now we're down to how simple math equates to this. These are actually measurements of Simba, of his bones, that I've built, again, just like you would build a house. You start with a foundation. This is the skeletal structure, and that's the foundation for all this. So let me say that in being a glorified Xerox machine that I am, I find this much easier than trying to do the style of work that Josh Toby or the abstract work that uh, Jen Farnsworth or Amy Ringholtz does because they're using their imagination. I think that is so much harder than me just copying what I see in front of me. So this is just a system that works for me. And so it's been 31 years of developing it. It seems to work. So here we are. Now, let me, let me just check this out. As I'm working on this piece, you can see I can move everything. This is all jointed. So as I'm measuring this and mathematically scaling it to this, let's say I want that paw to be back a little bit further or forward. It's only moving where it would in real life. So again, if it wasn't for this armature that's jointed, if I were to bend that, it would just bend randomly. It wouldn't bend consistently where the joints are. So I have the confidence of knowing that those bones are the blueprint as I'm sculpting it. So with that said, this is a little mock-up of this armature. 
That's how it bends. Okay. So, anyway, with the segments that we're going to be showing you, I want to bring in all the artists I possibly can bring in that show with us to show you their amazing processes of how they create these masterpieces. And if you have any questions or you want to see their work, we have a brand new website that's a week old today that you can see all the works. If you're having a bad day, take a walk through our website. It'll make you smile. So with that said, um, next week, let's see how fast and how far I can get on this piece. And uh, we'll have a guest artist. I don't know who yet, but we'll be checking in on this piece as well as having our other guest artists. Oh, okay, so let's just say back to the live reference that, that I use in, in what I do. Uh, one of the stories I like to tell is when I got into an amazing situation where a gentleman named Casey Anderson, who's now the host of a lot of National Geographic shows, um, was the emissary to many of these animals I've had access to. So I wanted to sculpt a grizzly bear, so I went up to Montana and for three days, I sculpted this grizzly at a distance, for good reason. So Casey said, okay, I want you to stand behind the door of this vehicle. I'm gonna handle this grizzly bear, and you stay there in case something happens. You get in that car and close the door. Well, this bear was amazing. Casey had such a rapport with this animal, it was, it was un unreal. So I'm sculpting away day three, and Casey says, would you like to handle this bear? And I thought, oh my God, yes, I have to. So I walk up to the bear and I, he says, okay, now put your hand out, let him smell your hand. I put my hand out and the volume of air in that bear's chest was like a draft horse. And it wasn't until it breathed on my hand that I could see the volume in that animal. So I looked at my piece that was so lacking in that mass that if I had not had that bear breathe on my hand, I would not have translated it to that piece and every grizzly bear piece I've ever done since then. So those experiences go into the work that I have. You imagine again, like I said, walking with that mountain lion, touching his muscles, his shoulders, his bones as he's walking, and then finally get, having the opportunity to sculpt him. So it's really exciting for me to do that. So anyway, as we go through this piece, you'll see me build the bones. You'll see me, see me build the muscles, and then I'll put the skin and the hair over the top, just like building a house from the inside out. And so with that said, I guess that's it. Um, if we have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them later. Stay tuned with us next week. We'll have another artist on here, and you'll see this as it progresses. Thank you very much.